Hey everyone, welcome to this video full build tutorial today with Joshua Bardwell on the Apex 5 inch HD frame. If you're joining and you perhaps have seen the documentary and you want to build this drone, we'll have all the parts listed in the descriptions. We'll have other links in the descriptions to tutorials that uh, accommodate this build today. And if you have questions that are beyond this tutorial, you can also hit up Joshua by emailing him uh, or join uh, his live stream on Sunday nights, Monday nights. Go and watch the teaser to the documentary, which this build tutorial is supposed to be a part of. Um, and in the documentary, we'll have a QR code that links directly back to this full video tutorial because it's obviously too long to put in a documentary. Again, I can't stress enough, it is important to the documentary success to share that video link to the teaser of the documentary. And without any other waiting, let's go ahead and bring on Joshua Bardwell. Joshua, thank you for coming on. Thank um, you, James. Thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely. So I had picked out a uh, few elements that are kind of wide ranging across FPV, um, just to demonstrate what you can expect uh, from something that's mid to high level quality. It's or, good quality stuff. Yeah, some good yeah. quality stuff. I'm moving from analog to HD uh, digital signal in the air unit and DJI goggles. So excited about that. Um, Joshua, this is nothing new for you, right? You've been no, flying I've done this, for quite I've done time. this all before. Yeah. I have never actually built this exact frame before. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah. well, you know, but I'm, I will figure it out. Very nice. Uh, I did, however, crack open uh, one of the bags just to be able to measure and design these 3D prints. So we have two 3D prints, uh, one to mount the GoPro and one to mount the antennas on the tail of the drone. Nice. Fusion 360 CAD design software that I designed them in that's made by uh, from Autodesk. And it is a cloud-based program, very easy um, to to learn if you're, you're up for some YouTubing. Um, <laughs> James is just but, James is know. just really good at it. Well, okay. it, you can learn it. There are tutorials. Yeah. I, I only say that because I've been trying to learn Fusion 360, uh -huh. and I'm you know I could do a few things, but mm -hmm. I couldn't knock these out in a night. All right, so um, I will jump behind the camera because mm -hmm. that's what I do. I thought you were gonna up. I thought you were gonna build it, and I was just gonna help. Oh, like really uh, talk you through it. I guess you didn't get the memo. Oh. Uh, okay, Joshua's I can building the quad. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. So let's go over the parts that are gonna go into this build. And we're gonna start with the frame. It doesn't look that impressive sitting here in a plastic bag, but uh, when we get it put together, it's gonna to look pretty awesome. The, let's say the motors. The motors are hype train blaster motors uh, made by uh, Rotor Riot. And uh, they, they, you know, they spin around and they make the quadcopter fly. You gotta put propellers on the motors if you wanna fly. These are Ethics S4 props in uh, lemon lime flavor. This is the T-Motor F7 flight controller. The flight controller is basically the brains of the quad, it's just a little computer that runs a program that makes the quadcopter fly. And this right here is the ESC, electronic speed controller. And basically the motors don't spin without the ESC to drive them and make them spin and tell them how fast to spin. Uh, right here, this is the DJI Air Unit. It is a camera and a wireless radio, basically. It's a DJI video link, similar to the video link that you might see if you've got like a Phantom or a Mavic or something like that, but much higher performance, much lower latency for quadcopter pilots who are racing at really high speed, some, like, not like you would do with a Mavic. So that's gonna be our video link. That's gonna go to these goggles, the DJI video goggles and let you see where your quadcopter is flying. This is the FreeSky Tyrannus QX7, and anybody who's ever played video games should understand how this thing works. We're gonna move the sticks and tell the quadcopter what to do. We've also got a bunch of little switches that we can flip to arm, disarm the quad. And this is gonna send uh, control signals to the quadcopter uh, via its wireless antenna. And those are gonna be picked up by this, which although it's very, very small, might be one of the most important parts. This is the receiver, which receives the control signals and uh, outputs them to the flight controller. So this receiver is a TBS Crossfire, Team Black Sheep makes it. And it's called a Crossfire and it's one of the most reliable uh, and long distance control links you can get for a quadcopter. And that is 
Uh, oh, oh no, not quite all the parts. Right here, these 3D printed parts here, this is gonna hold our GoPro. A GoPro is not absolutely essential, but you're not gonna be able to sort of impress your mom with your awesome exploits or YouTube or, you know, you can't capture video really without a GoPro. Yes, the DJI Link is high definition if you think 720p is high definition, which technically it is, but this is not anything that most people are gonna be happy with, especially if you're doing kind of higher level you know, even sort of semi-pro or pro-grade stuff, you're gonna be running a GoPro. This GoPro is the Hero 7 Black, which is one of the most popular GoPros available today. This little guy here is GoPro Hero 5 Session, which unfortunately has been discontinued. So the first thing we're gonna do is assemble the frame, or at least begin to assemble the frame, just so we have something to put the electronics on. And the very first step is to install the press nuts in the arms. We're gonna put this nut or screw in and we're just gonna use that screw to pull the press nut in to the arm so that the press nut gets pressed into the arm. And as we tighten that down, that's gonna pull that press nut in. Don't go crazy, you can strip the press nut out with the press nut pressed into the arm like so. And we're just gonna do that four times once for each of the four arms. Two millimeter, 2.5 millimeter, and 1.5 millimeter hex drivers are very, very commonly used in this size and style of quad. So you definitely, definitely gonna get a lot of use out of those. Resist the urge to get some Allen wrenches, get a nice hex screwdriver. You're gonna be working with it a lot. Why do we have separate arms? And the reason is that the arms on a quadcopter like this are most likely part to break in a crash. So the idea is, if the arm breaks, you want to easily be able to change the arm without having to rebuild the whole bottom plate and the whole electronics. You'll see when we finish the build how much work goes into building the electronics. Being able to just swap an arm by itself is pretty nice. Next, we're going to install four press nuts on the bottom main plate. And unlike the arms where there basically was no way to get it wrong because it was just flush. On this one, we're going to want to make sure we are installing the press nuts on the opposite side from these countersunk holes right here. So we're gonna flip that over with the countersinks on bottom and the flat side. It's very clever how they're using these flat washers here. Uh, getting the press nuts installed in the carbon can be tricky. Some people try to hammer them in, but then they don't go in straight and you can, you can deform them. Um, if you try to just pull them in with a screw, sometimes you can damage the carbon. So using a flat washer to spread out the force is actually really smart way of doing this. Oh uh, yeah, um, the Apex is one of the most premium FPV frames, a freestyle frame, I guess you'd call it. Uh, it's one of the most premium ones, and it definitely has a lot of design elements that cheaper frames don't have. You know, I mentioned earlier that the routing this out, that's extra work in the manufacturing and design to make that fit flush. Um, a lot of frames would just have a nut on the other side, and then it wouldn't be flush, and like you would lose the nut right, as you're trying to insert, or you'd have to hold the nut in place as you're trying to insert the screw. So the next step is to decide which of these two sets of mounting holes we want to use to mount our flight controller and ESC. Flight controllers and ESCs come in at least two common sizes. One is 30 by 30 millimeters and one is 20 by 20 millimeters. And the flight controller and ESC that we are using is a 30 millimeter size. So we're going to use these 30 millimeter holes. So these screws are going to hold our flight controller and our ESC in the frame. And they're gonna go up through these countersunk holes. This is another example of the kind of thing I was just talking about. Uh, very, very few frames would go to the trouble of countersinking these and providing these countersunk head screws. This is a pretty slick little uh, thing that they've done. So these screws are gonna be held in place with an M3 
nylock nut. A nylock nut means that it has a nylon insert inside the nut and that helps keep it from loosening up, especially when you're subject to vibration and shock like a quadcopter is. Nylock nuts are very, very, uh, they're pretty much essential. Otherwise, almost anything else will rattle loose and back off if you don't uh, find some way to, maybe you could use Loctite, but Nylock is a great, a great alternative. Now in this particular frame, they've made a very interesting design decision. These screw heads are not going to be accessible once the frame is fully assembled. So we gotta make sure we got these nice and tight because once we finish assembling the frame, we will not have the option to go back and mess with them unless we take the frame apart. These cone washers are really growing on me. A lot of frames would just use, a lot of frames do just use the screws uh, and the screws really dig into the carbon and it's, it's fine, but these cone washers are really growing on me. So then this frame has a keystone, they call it, or a key, keystone? I think they call it a keystone. And it is gonna go in between these arms and hold them all sort of into place. And what you're supposed to do is rotate the third arm out. There we go. Oh, look at that. See how that cinches down? It keeps it all nice and tight. So now we've got these four arms installed and the keystone in place, just like so. We're not gonna tighten down these bolts. We're just gonna leave the arms a little bit loose. The next thing I'm gonna do is take these shoulder bolts, and they are called shoulder bolts because they have an unthreaded shoulder here. Um, are they bolts or screws? Tell me in the comments. And we're gonna take, and we're gonna put those up from the underside of the frame through the outer armhole. So there's two screws holding the arm in for rigidity. That's gonna go up through, and we're gonna actually do that for all four of these. And what you can do is you can just squeeze the arms a little bit to help hold the screws in place so they don't fall out when you flip it over. And we're gonna take the upper bottom plate and we're gonna install it on top and these press nuts are gonna get threaded into those screws. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna get them started into the threads and get them barely snug. And what they tell you to do the, in the official build instructions is to install this in a circular pattern doing one turn at a time on each one. Kind of like when you're installing a car tire or car wheel, you don't, you go around in a circle, you don't just try and screw them all down at once. All right, so now we have the whole sort of bottom part of the quadcopter frame assembled. The next thing we're gonna do is put the motors on. I like to build from the outside in. Some people like to start with the electronics in the center and work out towards the motors. It's just not how I like to do it. I think the frame looks awesome with motors on it. So I like to get the motors on as soon as I can. All motors come with motor screws, but the motor manufacturer doesn't know how thick your arms are. So they don't know, they just guess. And they give you screws. And then if those screws are the wrong length for your frame, then you're screw screwed, <laughs> uh, pun intended. Now, a really amazingly thoughtful frame designer will have included screws with the frame because he knows how thick his arms are, or she. They know how thick their arms are. It turns out that it did because the apex comes with these motor, uh, they're skids, they're called skids, and they go on the bottom, and when you land the quad, oh, that's the top, they go on the bottom, and when you land the quad, they keep the quad from taking damage. If you're landing on asphalt or something, it's gonna scuff it uh, and help protect the screw heads. They may even keep the screw heads from digging in if they're big enough, and they have included screws to go with it, so that's awesome. So now that I've found the correct length of screw, I'm gonna go ahead and insert that through the skid and install it in the arm. The motor is gonna, what's gonna hold that in, but you can see the screw just extends above the arm 
just a couple millimeters. Um, and we're going to go ahead and take one of these motors and just get that threaded and started. One of the things that's nice about these blaster motors, and one of the reasons we picked them, is that they come with a lifetime replacement program. Uh, motors are one of the most common things that breaks on a quadcopter. They they take a lot of hits, and uh, at you know twenty five dollars a piece, or maybe less, maybe not, whatever you cost, they can add up. And the uh, the blasters can you can just uh, I think you have to pay like a like a seven dollars or something processing fee or whatever. And then they just send you a new one. So, so we got that installed. We've got, uh, I'm gonna put the four screws in. We've just got two screws holding it loosely. I'm gonna go ahead and finish installing all four motors and I'll see it right back here. So now the motors are all installed and we are starting to get something that kind of looks like a quadcopter, but we got to do the electronics. And that means we're gonna get to the part where we're gonna start soldering. And that means it's where everyone's gonna fall on their face. Cause a lot of people don't know how to solder and there's no way around it. You just, you have to learn to solder if you're gonna be in this hobby. Maybe someday it will be completely solder free. Everything will plug in and, and but we're not there yet. So this is not a soldering tutorial, but if you don't know how to solder, you should go learn how to solder. Sorry, I know you want it, you're hoping to fly this afternoon. And what you're probably gonna do is you're just gonna charge ahead and do your best and maybe it'll be okay or maybe your quad will fall out of the air because one of your solder joints was bad. But I've, I've done my due diligence and we're gonna proceed. So the ESC is gonna come with these, they call them gummies. They're just little silicone gr grommets. I don't know what you wanna call them. And they actually go in here, I'll show you the flight controller. The flight controller seems to have come with them pre-installed, but the ESC hasn't. Uh, and they're for shock absorption. Uh, they help protect the electronics from damage. And in the case of the flight controller, the flight controller has a gyro sensor, a gyroscope sensor on it that it's essential to flight. And the vibrations of the quadcopter motors will make the gyro work better. And so these, this vibration isolation is very important for good flight characteristics and the longevity of the hardware. And we have to get these gummies through here and it's, it's kind of a hassle. I've kind of gotten good at it. It's the too big. You want to use the two millimeter tip or maybe even the 1.5 millimeter. And you can kind of just work it through here. So the next thing we got to do is we've got to install the main battery lead. We're going to hear me call it the XT60 lead. This connector is called an XT60 connector. Uh, and we have to solder it on here. The other thing we're gonna need to do, did this come with a capacitor? It sure did. This, this little fella here is called a capacitor and it is essential to not blowing up your ESC. So we're gonna install that too. They've done a really cool thing with this ESC. They've got these two teeny tiny little holes here to install the capacitor and hold it in place while you solder it up. Now the capacitor we're using is called an electrolytic capacitor and it is polarized. And what that means is that there is a negative leg and a positive leg. And if you get those backwards, it will go off like a little tiny, remember those little poppers that you used to have when you were a kid that pop, that little bit of whatever inside them. The capacitor is labeled with a white stripe and a, that's a negative symbol there. And that leg is the negative leg. The other one is by inference, the positive leg. And we're gonna look at the ESC and we can see the ESC is labeled with a plus and a minus indicating which of these pads is negative and positive. And we're just gonna install the, ES, uh, the capacitor through those little holes. And I'm just gonna kind of bend it over so it's more or less flush. I wanna put some thought into how this is all gonna to go together before I start soldering this up. So I'm gonna install the ESC on these screws. The screws are a little tight in this, in the gummies. If I go too hard, I will push the gummies out, so. And then I'm gonna get the DJI air unit and I'm just gonna start thinking about how it's gonna mount up and we can immediately see we've run into a problem because the capacitor is gonna be in the way 
of the DJI Air Unit. So we don't want to just sort of charge blithely ahead. I think we're going to want to run this wire. Are we going to want to run it underneath or over or between the flight controller? Let's see if we push this ESC all the way down. So it sure looks like we've got a little room under there. We could probably run that cable underneath. That's going to be fine. So then the next thing I'm going to do is install the standoffs so that the air unit is installed correctly relative to the standoffs. And I've got four short standoffs and four long standoffs. And the reason for that is that the back of the quadcopter is at a different height than the, than the front. So the short standoffs are going to go in the back and the long standoffs are going to go in the front. I guess I should probably install the antennas holder too. So this is going to go, oh yeah, it fits right in there. It doesn't have a lot of room to spare, does it? So that's where that's going to go. And they are going to go, you've got this 3D printed, James printed uh, this, he designed this 3D printed holder here. So this is not stock, but uh, Let's also get out this plug, which the flight controller is going to use. So the flight controller is made to plug directly into the DJI Air unit for convenience. And then I'm going to just look in the supplied wires that came with it. Yeah, I'm going to use the longer of the wires. I'm going to plug into the back of the air unit. And that's going to come up here and it will plug into the flight controller. So no soldering there. That's one of the advantages of building a DJI build is they are much more likely to have that be a, a plug connection instead of a solder connection. So that's nice. We'll stick that down with this double-sided mounting tape. This is Scotch Extreme Outdoor Mounting Tape. All right, so then we'll put that down and we'll just give it a little wiggle. So then we're going to install these antennas. And one of the biggest challenges with the DJI Air unit is keeping the antennas installed. The, um, the MMCX connector is the name of the connector that's used on those antennas and it often can pop out. We got that on top there and that on top. There and then they, how are they going to go, James? You, let's see if I can figure out how he designed this. It's going to come together like that. And then I guess that'll be like, and then we're going to need a zip ties to hold that together. Yeah, no, that's not bad. I was about to say that this part of the tutorial is not going to be super helpful because these are custom designed pieces. These are not the pieces that we didn't get the pieces in time for this shoot. So James just knocked these out overnight and designed them himself. But 3D printing, you could we could just put these up on Thingiverse and James is totally going to do that because I just decided that he would. So if you do want to, Apex, uh, Impulse RC makes great accessories for the frame and if you want to use those more power to you if you want to use the exact ones that i'm using here uh we'll put a link in the video description to these exact ones so i recorded i put the zip tie in wrong we're going to record me doing it correctly so this zip tie is going to go through this slit at the top and then down and through the second slit here and then back up through itself. And then you're going to want to make sure to get one of the antennas going through the bottom and one going through the top. So they're at the correct angle. And then as you cinch that down, it'll hold them at the correct angle relative to each other. Perfect. I always like to back up my tape with a little bit of zip tie. I just feel like that's a good idea. It's ugly, whatever. 
Now with the ESC, I suppose. And hmm. so I think we have all this room up front, right? Let's just take the ESC and spin it around this way and see if that would work. So then we're going to have a plug coming out of the ESC, go into the flight controller. And that's going to be this plug. And it says right here, ESC. Very nice. Thank you, T-Motor. That's brilliant. And this probably says FC, flight controller. Brilliant again. And when those guys are put together, is that going to create an issue? No, there's plenty of room there. So I think that's what we're going to do. Okay, so here's what I've come up with. I would like to say, if you're doing a build that someone else has designed, they've picked the exact parts and you're following along, you don't have to solve these problems. But every single build you do where you have, oh, I, I want to use this flight controller. Well, that's not the exact one the frame designer thought you might use. You got to solve problems like this and you just got to love it. I mean, some people are rolling their eyes right now, and some people are like, yes, tell me what you did. And if you're the second kind of person, this is the hobby for you. Um, so what we've come up with is, I think that this needs to come out the front. And that's going to let, we have so much room up here. The only thing that's going to go up here is the camera. So we've got tons of room up here. We're really tight in the back. We're just going to flip the ESC around 180 degrees and have this wire come out the front. That's not how it's usually done, but there's no reason why it wouldn't work. And it's really this capacitor that is making us need to make these special accommodations. So the next thing we're going to do is prep the motor wires to solder to the ESC. And in order to do that, I'm just going to hold it against the arm and run it out to the pad where it's going to get soldered. And then I'm just going to cut it off just a little further in than that, just to give myself a little bit of extra room. There's Nothing more annoying than cutting the motor wires exactly the right length and then finding out they're not long enough. And then you basically, you know, you're, there's solutions to that, but they're annoying. So the motors are three phase brushless motors, and that means they have three wires coming out of them. And the wires connect to three of the pads on the ESC. Um, one, two, three for this motor. One, two, three for that motor and so forth. And it actually turns out it doesn't, there's no wrong way to wire it up. Um, uh, so we're just gonna take and wire them flat, lay them flat against the arm and run them one, two, three in that order to the pads on the ESC. So we've cut the motor wires to length. The next thing we're gonna do is we get out our soldering iron. Now there's a lot of different soldering irons you could be using. There's some expensive, uh, you know, bench irons, big honking things. Uh, this is a little portable iron. It's called the TS-100. And it's freaking, it's really amazing, actually. Uh, for a small, inexpensive iron, it works very, very well. And then this one has come with two different tips. This is a conical tip. It's not my favorite. And this is a like a bevel tip. I guess we're going to go with that one. For these motor wires, we want a heavier tip. A, he a larger, heavier tip will hold heat better and will work better for larger joints. There's a grub screw here that is in our way. So this is actually James's iron that he got for this build, and he's going to keep this one. This is mine, and it has left-handed firmware on it. It flips the screen over so I can see it because I'm left-handed. So I'm going to use this one instead of this one going forward, but it's the same iron. It's just a different color. Okay. <clears throat> the solder we're using is Kester brand. It's a very good brand of solder. 6337 alloy. Um, 6040 alloy is also okay. You want leaded solder. Europeans, I know you can't get that. It's harder to solder with lead-free solder. And they're like, oh, well, it's good for the environment to have lead-free solder. And it's like, this is... If you're Sony and you're making a million televisions, use lead-free solder, right? But if you're building a quadcopter, just it's so it's like no lead, and it's not lead exposure either. Unless you eat it, you're not going to get. It's fine. Use leaded solder if you can possibly get it. It's also rosin core solder, which means it has flux inside it. And in, in fact, the best thing to what is flux? It's a chemical that makes you solder better. Um, you can also add a little bit of flux. This is a, a flux pen. Uh, and it's just like a little marker pen that you kind of get the flux 
on the pads. Uh, I highly, highly recommend you buy a kind of flux called No Clean Flux. Um, if you get the other kind of flux that isn't No Clean, it can cause short circuits and fires and flames damage your stuff. So No Clean Flux is really what you want. I'm just going to tin these pads. And tin means to add a small amount of solder to the pad in preparation for soldering. Normally when I solder, I lean way in and I lift my glasses up because I'm getting to that age where you have to look really close at things. Uh, kids ask your parents. So I'm not gonna do that because we're shooting a video and I don't want my head to be in the shot, but it does mean that my soldering is gonna be a little sloppier maybe than it normally would be. That's my excuse for why my solder is not as good as it should be, and I'm sticking to it. See, look, I've already screwed this one up. That's why I'm saying that. Okay. What I'm trying to get is the solder to kind of, see how I haven't really, I haven't really, it's not taking up the whole of the pad. I really want the solder to take up the whole of the pad. The whole pad should get hot and the solder should flow to the edge of the pad. Um, for the for the XT60 lead, I'm going to add some fresh solder here. It does come from the factory with solder on it, but the factory uses lead-free solder, and that is not as good as leaded solder. Um, you can also add a little bit of flux. So the XT60, I realized I, it's too long. You don't want the XT60 to be longer than it needs to be because it'll flap loose, it'll get chopped up by the props, and then bad things will happen. So I have snipped it to a little bit of a shorter length. It, let me not burn my hand with my solder knife. I've snipped it to a little bit shorter length, and you'll also notice I've cut them to different lengths. And the reason is that it's going to come out the side, so it's going to kind of go like this. And that's, uh, that's what we're going to do. That's a little, that's okay. In general, I want the amount of exposed wire to be about the same as the size of the pad. This is just a little bigger than the pad, but I think we're gonna go with it. And I am gonna lean in here, James, so the overhead cam will be shot, but. This is gonna take a minute because it has to heat so much metal and it's just gonna, have to sit on it. Okay. Good. Okay, good enough. Like I said, you should learn to solder before you do this. Now that we've soldered up the XT60 connector, we're gonna do a very basic check. And the reason for that is that if we screwed up this solder joint somehow, then when we plug in the battery for the first time, bad things will happen. And it's better to find that out now rather than after we finish the build and have to redo a whole bunch of work. So we're gonna get a multimeter and the multimeter has a continuity test mode. Uh, and the way that works is when there's electrical continuity between the probes, it beeps. And we're just gonna check our XT60. We're gonna check the two prongs of the XT60. And we should not hear a beep or we should hear a very short beep that stops. And I'm just gonna reverse those two real quick red to black, black, red to red, black to black, and then the other way around. And there was a very short beep there, but it did end. Uh, that's good. 
And if you hear a beep, it means that your solder is touching between the two pads. And when you plug in the battery, bad smoke will come out. The other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna plug a battery in and we're gonna see if smoke comes out. But we're gonna use this little guy here, which is called a smoke stopper. This is made by, there's various forms of smoke stopper out there. Um, this one is a solid state device. It's made by a company called V-Fly. This is the V-Fly short saver is what they call it. And basically if there is some kind of an electrical fault, like I bridged the solder pads or I got a blob of solder somewhere it shouldn't be. If there's an electrical fault that would fry something, instead this little guy will act like a fuse and it'll just sh shut off. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a battery, we're gonna plug the battery in to the short saver. We got a green light here and we're gonna plug in here to the XT60 and we want that light to stay green. And it did, and that's good. Now we're reasonably confident that that XT60 lead is good. There's no bad solder joints or fire is gonna come out. We can proceed. And the next step is gonna to be to solder up the motor wires. I've already cut the motor wires to length. I'm going to strip them and then I'm gonna solder them up. And as I said before, I'm just gonna lay them flat against the arm and then go one, two, three for this back right motor, one, two, three for the front right, and just work my way around soldering them up. So I'm just gonna take this piece of paper from the motor box and I'm just gonna stick it on top of the ESC. Sometimes when you're soldering, you can get little spatters uh, and you can get a little solder ball or solder blob on your electronics and that's bad. Uh, I didn't do that for the XT60 because I, I tinned it far away. But for these guys, I'm gonna be tinning them right here and they're just gonna be hanging in the air on top of the ESC so the chances of getting a solder ball are a little higher. Again, you want it to be about the same size as the pad. So just a couple millimeters should be fine. You get a sun. I'm angling them towards the motor a little bit. It does I think that's better than if they just come straight off. Because and what I'm going to look for here is I don't want to see any situations where the solder bridges between the two pads. And I don't want to see any situations where the solder is touching this metal thing, this metal cover. So this ESC is basically a computer, a little tiny computer that manages the spinning of the motor and the driving of the phases. So as the motor speeds up, the driving of the phases stays in sync with it. And essentially without the ESC, this motor couldn't spin. So now that we've got the motor soldered up, we once again are gonna take our smoke stopper and we're gonna plug in and we're gonna see that everything is okay. Good. Perfect. That uh, that do 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 sound is the ESC initializing. That's the initialization tone. The reason we didn't hear that before is because the motor is actually the speaker coil. The ESC like literally vibrates the motor to make that sound. And um, hearing that sound and seeing that the smoke stopper stayed green tells us that our solder and wiring is we're good to go and ready to proceed. Now we're going to get our flight controller out. And we need to, we almost don't need to do a thing because the air unit is, it just plugs right into the flight controller and there's no soldering or anything. And that's gonna get our video and, and most of the things we need is gonna be handled through this plug. But there is one thing that we need to do and that is to connect the Crossfire receiver to the flight controller. So let's go ahead and do that.
I am soldering up the receiver to the flight controller. So the receiver has to get power and it has to have a connection, a communications connection, which is called a UART, U-A-R-T. Um, that's a mistake. There we go. Put the wrong wire in the wrong place. Some of these wires are going to carry power to the receiver uh, from the five volt regulator on the flight controller. Some of them are going to carry the data that the receiver is sending. DJI air unit plug has to plug in here because it can't, we can't rotate it 180 degrees. So the air unit has to plug in here and then this plug can go here. Oh, and because we rotated the ESC, but we still have enough room to, oh, yes. Here. One, two, three, four. So we'll go ahead and start putting these nuts on just to start holding this in place is gonna go basically on top of the air unit here. And we're gonna to need to get the antenna and fish that through. Receiver's no good without an antenna. Uh, this antenna mounts in the back here in this very clever 3D printed mount. But what I'm gonna do first is fish the cord up through here, yes. We'll put that in there. We'll come back and zip tie that in a minute once we're sure that everything's where it needs to be. And then this is going to snap right on here. So the next thing we need to do is put this heat shrink on the receiver uh, to keep it from electrically shorting or having problems. We gotta keep the electricity inside. <laughs> All right, let's get this right. It's fast as heck. I always use the double-sided tape for shock absorption, even if I may not need it for stickiness. I'm just gonna take a little bit of that and put it under the receiver for shock absorption. And it'll help hold the receiver in place, I guess. And when I'm done, I'll put a zip tie around all of that. So the Apex frame comes with these little 3D printed, I guess you could call them bushings. And I believe they go on the inside here just to help hold the camera in place. And the DJI camera actually comes with its own screws, so we don't need to use the screws that came with the frame. They're longer, so we're gonna use the screws that came with the frame after all. It's just so we make sure we got enough threads on there. So I'm just gonna take one of these guys, and it's also nice that that holds it in, it holds the screw in. So this is such a thoughtfully designed frame. All these little touches. I'm gonna screw that into the top hole. Also, the DJI camera has an upward facing arrow. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that that is facing up. If, like I did on my first build, you screw that up, it can be flipped in software. So don't freak out if you get it wrong. You can fix it. Okay, we'll get it. Okay, perfect. I need a camera like the office to just make reaction shots to. <laughs> So we've got the camera, it's mounted now, and one of the things we're gonna do is set the amount of up tilt. Um, the more up tilt, the further forward you will tend to pitch the quad when you fly, and basically the faster the quad will go. So for a beginner, you would wanna start with the camera 
not quite completely at zero degrees flat and level, but a little 10 or 15 degrees up tilt, not much. If you're very experienced and you want to go super fast, you can go to the maximum. I'm probably just going to set it somewhere around in the middle. You can always change it after the fact. At this point, the quadcopter is basically done. Now, but I'm not going to finish assembling it. I'm not going to put the top plate on and stuff. I'm going to do all of the configuration in case I, like, let's say I screwed something up and I need to desolder something. I don't want to have to take it all apart again. So we're going to now proceed to configuring the software and doing the final setup. And then we'll put the top plate on and we'll finish actually sort of button, like take care of these loose wires and everything. We've, we've built the body like fr Frankenstein's monster. Now it's time to hit it with some lightning and have it uh, rise from the table. And um, in order to do that, we've got my laptop out, we got the controller, and we're gonna go through a whole bunch of steps. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna bind this radio to this receiver. Uh, and basically that tells the receiver that this is the radio that it should be listening to. You could be flying, there could be multiple people out there and they could all have a radio and you could be flying at the same time. How do you know who's controlling which quad? Binding is the way that that happens. So in order to put this in bind mode, I'm going to use a, this a little script that runs, a little program that runs on the radio and I'm going to run that crossfire script and I'm going to go to bind and put the module into binding mode. You can also, also do that just by pushing the little button on the back of the module, um, but it can be a little confusing when pushing the button what to, what to, you know, what it's doing. So with the radio in binding mode, I'm now gonna plug in and as soon as I plug in, it should pick up the receiver and detect that the receiver wants to bind. So we're just gonna take a little tool we're gonna press the bind button on the receiver and it will begin blinking a green light indicating it is in binding mode. If it powered up and it was already blinking a green light, then it's already in binding mode. On the back of the module, we have a yellow or orange LED, whatever you wanna call that. We're gonna press that one time. At that point, it should go blinking blue and if it does that, it means that a firmware update is needed on the receiver. And we will press one more time. At that point, it will go solid blue. And that indicates that the firmware update is happening. We're just gonna leave it. Don't unplug anything, just wait. It may take a couple minutes, like literally a couple minutes. Binding. I've got solid green here. Oh, now we got solid green. Yeah. Yay! Solid green! It's all done. It's bound. See how easy that was? Once we have once we have solid green LED here on the back of the receiver or the module and the solid green LED on the receiver, they are bound and they are talking, and now we can proceed. The next thing I need to do is create a new model on this radio. The radio is capable of being bound to many different quadcopters at the same time you're probably gonna have, you don't wanna have a different radio for every single quad you own. So in order to do that, I'm gonna press the menu key one time and here's all the models that are on this radio. I'm just gonna find an empty spot. I'm gonna click and create new model. To begin the setup, I'm gonna press menu one time and page to get to the setup screen. And I'm gonna scroll down and what I need to do is set the external RF mode to crossfire for my crossfire uh, module. And there are a few other things I like to do on this screen. One is to enable extended limits. That's gonna do it for now. Next, I'm gonna go into Betaflight. If you need to download and install Betaflight, there's some drivers, there's an app you have to install. I got a tutorial about how to do that. I'll, it'll be linked in the video description, but we're gonna assume that you've got Betaflight installed for now. And we're gonna take our USB cable and plug it in to our flight controller. And when we do that, we will see a new COM port appear right here, COM14 for me, it could be a different number for you. And I'm gonna hit connect. 
I'm going to go to the ports tab and we're going to need to tell the flight controller which devices are connected to which of those UARTs, the ports, the input output ports that we talked about previously. Um, the default settings for this flight controller are not set up. T motor, what are you thinking? You know, T, T, you, you got it set, you got the wire set up. Why don't you have the configuration set up? Well, let's update Betaflight. We're only on Betaflight 411. Betaflight 4.2 is the latest. Let's try and we'll update it and see if that fixes it. I'm gonna look in the upper left here. The target for this flight controller is T-Motor F7. You need to know that every time you flash the firmware uh, because every flight controller will have a different target name. T-Motor F7 is the target for this one. So I'm gonna disconnect. I'm gonna to go to the firmware flasher tab. I'm gonna choose T-Motor F7 here in this pull down. I'm gonna choose the latest version of Betaflight here, which for at the time of this recording is 422. I'll hit load firmware and flash firmware. At that point here in the upper right hand corner, you should see this menu option change to DFU. If it doesn't do that, you may need to install your drivers. You may need to do some of the things that were talked about in the video about downloading and installing the drivers. Now, but we're flashing, we're good to go. We'll let that finish. Having done that, I'm gonna connect. The first time you connect to a Betaflight flight controller after flashing to Betaflight 4.2, it will ask you to apply custom defaults. Just always say yes to that. Apply custom defaults, yes. If you don't do that, your whole flight controller won't work. You'll, you, it's not permanently broken, you just need to flash it again. And then, it's shouting at us that we need to calibrate our accelerometer. The accelerometer is how the quadcopter knows which way up is, which sometimes it needs to know. So we're gonna to go to the setup tab with the quadcopter flat and level on the table. We're gonna hit calibrate accelerometer. And when that's done, now let's go to the ports tab and yep, nope, still, still no default ports set up so we'll do it by we'll do it so looking at the plug for the air unit i can see that tx2 and rx2 are in here and i got to apologize i'm just going to tell you what to do here how to set up the ports tab it really is nice if a manufacturer does this for you they know where the air unit is coming i'm not trying to dog on t motor it's a very good flight controller just kind of an oversight that they haven't done this all automatically we know that UART2 is where the DJI air unit is gonna get plugged in. That's the whole point of this flight controller. So we need to enable MSP on UART2. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't they already do that for you? I don't know, but they didn't. The other thing we need to do is our crossfire receiver. We put on TX5 and R RX5, that's UART number five. That's why TX5 and RX5. And we're gonna to go to UART5 and we're gonna enable Serial RX. And that is all we need to do. Next, we're gonna go into the configuration tab of Betaflight. We're gonna to need to set the motor output protocol um, and the correct motor output protocol for this flight controller and ESC is DSHOT 600. And we should set the receiver type to serial based receiver and the serial receiver provider to Crossfire. We're also gonna enable the telemetry option here under other features. And I would also like you to enable this option, DSHOT beacon configuration, enable that for both RX Lost and RX Set. And here's what that does. A lot of people like to put a buzzer on a quad, a beeper. And so that like if you crash and you're in some bushes or some tall grass, you can't find your quad, you can make a beep. You can just go like beep, 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 pull a, pull a switch on your controller. And that helps you find it. Um, well, this doesn't have a beeper on it, but the motors can actually beep, right? When you plug in, they go boop, boop, boop. Well, we can just make them beep whenever we want. And by enabling this option, it lets us use the motors to beep instead of having to put a separate beeper on the quad. So we'll enable that. And uh, what else do we need to do here? Uh, the, under the arming angle, 
I want you to set the arming angle to 180 degrees. The arming angle is designed to help prevent you from accidentally arming the quad when you didn't mean to. Like if you just picked it up off the ground, you're done flying and you accidentally bump the arm switch and then the propeller spin and maybe it cuts you. You don't want that. The arming angle says if the quad is not flat and level, don't arm it, which sounds like a good idea, except if you're trying to take off and there's like a little rock underneath your quad and it's not flat and level, and then you can't arm and you're like, ah, ah. So I usually turn that off by setting it to 180. Let's go ahead and save and reboot here. Let's see what we got. That's a good sign. We've got a normal startup beep. Let's go next to the receiver tab and let's see if there's any movement in the receiver tab. We know that we got binding here, but then is the flight controller hearing the signal from the receiver? And if I move the sticks, I can see that I do see movement in this tab. So that means that that's good. That means the flight controller is seeing the movement of our sticks. But uh, the next thing we need to check is the channel mapping. And you'll notice when I raise the throttle here on the left, the roll channel is actually what's moving. So that's called the channel mapping is incorrect. And we can fix that by rearranging these settings here. The channel map tells the flight controller what order the channels are going to come in. It's set to A, E, T, R. And you can see over here on the left, those same letters, A, E, R, T. And by rearranging the A, E, T, R, we can rearrange the channel order. So I'm moving throttle, but roll is moving. So maybe it needs to be A, E, R, T. Before you go changing these manually, there's actually a second, there are a couple of presets here that usually are correct. So we're going to try the spectrum preset and that's going to change it to T, A, E, R. I'm going to hit save. And now sure enough, Throttle, correct. Yaw, correct. Pitch, correct. Roll, correct. We have the right channels and they're moving the right order. When I move the stick down, it goes down to a low value. When I move it up, it goes up to a high value. When I move the stick left, it goes to a low value. When I move it to the right, it goes to a high value. So our channel mapping and channel order is correct. The other thing we need to check is our channel endpoints. And you'll see when I lower the stick, the channel goes to 988, and when I raise the stick, it goes to a little over 2000. And for the sake of this tutorial, we're gonna leave that. I have a whole nother video about precisely setting your endpoints. In this case, the endpoints are close enough that we're gonna move on, but I'll put a link to that in the video description if you wanna check that out. The next thing I wanna do is go back to the configuration tab. I want you to turn on the bi-directional D-shot option. Um, this is an option that not all ESCs are going to support out of the box. This ESC does support this option out of the box. Um, and so I want you to turn that on. It'll help your quadcopter fly better. Um, if you can use this, you should. If you enable this option and save and reboot, then go to the motors tab and you see this E, 0%. That is the error percent. And if your ESC doesn't support bi-directional D-shot, that'll read 100%. And then you would, well, there's two things you can do. You can update the firmware on your ESC, or you can just go back and turn it off again. I have videos on how to update the firmware. It's working. We're just going to proceed. The next thing we need to do is set up our aux modes, auxiliary modes. And those are functions that the uh, flight controller can activate, specifically arming and disarming the quad so you can fly but other functions like I said, oh, you could flip a switch and the buzzer would go off. Well, that's, a, that's an aux mode. And we're gonna set these up. Before we can set these up on the flight controller, we need to set them up in the radio. And you're probably gonna notice that this radio has a ton of switches. What do they all do? They don't do anything. They also do whatever you tell them to do. But the flip side of that is that you have to tell them what to do. There's no predefined function for any of these switches. So, hang on, sorry. So the first thing we need to do is tell the radio which switch is going to control which aux channel. So if we look here in the receiver tab, we can see that there are 12 auxiliary channels. The first four channels are the main flight channels, the, the main sticks, and then those aux channels could be used for any function that we wanna use them for. So first we're gonna tell the radio this switch controls this aux channel. And then we're going to tell the flight controller 
this aux channel activates this function. Here's how we do that first part. I'm going to press menu. I'm going to page to the mixer screen right here, mixer. I'm going to scroll down to the first unused channel, channel five. Channel five is aux one, channel six is aux two and so forth. I'm going to click the uh, jog wheel here. I'm going to go down to source and I'm going to click once and source will begin to blink. And then I'm going to flip the switch that I want to map to this aux channel. So in this case, I'm going to flip this upper left shoulder switch and the source will change to read SF. I'm going to click one time so it stops blinking and I'm going to hit exit and that's, oh, exit one more time. There we go. Now we're back at the mixer screen. That's literally all you have to do. I want you to do that again for channel six. We're going to go to source. For channel six, let's flip this three position switch, this small three position switch on the outside here. Finally, we're going to do it again for channel seven. Source and channel seven, we're going to make this momentary switch here and exit and exit all the way out. So we've set up one, two, three aux channels. And you look in the receiver tab here and you can see that as I flip the switches, those aux channels are moving. Great. So now we need to tell the flight controller what each of those aux channels is meant to do. And we do that in the modes tab. And the first mode, flight mode that we're going to add is arming mode. We can arm and disarm the quad when we want to fly. We're going to do that by clicking add range. And then we're just going to move that switch one time. And when we do that, we should see this auto change from auto to aux one. So it automatically picks up which aux channel we moved when we moved that switch. If it ever doesn't automatically pick it up, you can manually assign it to the correct aux channel for that switch. Then what we're going to do is we're going to put the switch in the armed position. And we're going to look at this little yellow tick mark right here, which moves as we move the channel, drag this yellow uh, range, this channel range over so it's on top of the arm position and hit save. And basically what we're telling the flight controller is when this channel is in this position, this flight mode should become active. I'm going to disable this hide unused modes for the time being to bring back all these other modes that I haven't set up yet. Um, the way I like to set up the remaining modes are I'm going to add an angle mode. That's auto level mode. If you like to fly an auto level mode, um, angle mode, I'm going to put it on this switch right here and I'm going to have it be the middle position on that switch. I'm going to add flip over after crash. I'm going to add range there and have it be the down position on that switch. And finally, I'm going to add the buzzer mode or beeper mode and have that be the the pulled position on that switch. I'm going to hit save and I'm going to hide unused modes and I can just double check now. Okay. Beeping works. Angle mode. You can see that it's turning yellow here. Angle mode is active. Flip over crash turtle mode is active and arming won't activate while we're plugged into the computer for safety, but I can see that it did turn red, which means that it would activate except that we're something stopping it, which is that we're plugged in. So our flight modes are good to go. Okay, well, we're almost ready to fly. We've got to check on our motors and we got to make sure, oh, and you remember I didn't install the flight controller facing the right way around and I didn't install the ESC facing the right way around. Yeah, let's fix that. The first thing I need to do, this is a little bit of an advanced move. I'm going to show you because this is just really how we build the quad. So I'm going to show you how to do it. I have a whole tutorial on how to fix this problem. I'm going to go a little fast and if you want to, you can watch the whole tutorial on why I'm doing the things I'm doing. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move the quad and I'm going to watch this 3D model and see that it moves the correct direction. Oh, I guess the flight controller is facing the right way. That is so convenient. As I tip forward, the 3D model pitches forward, roll to the right, roll to the left. That's fantastic. So the flight controller is working, but watch the motors are not because I spun the ESC around. If I go to the motors tab, 
my props are off. What I'm going to do is I'm going to raise the slider for motor number one, and that should be the back right motor as this diagram shows. And when I do that, the front left motor is spinning. It's flipped around 180 degrees. Here's how I'm going to fix that. We've got slider number one, two, three, and four. And we've got position number. And when I raise slider number one, position number four moved. Let's keep filling in this table. I'm going to raise slider number two, position number three moved. I'm going to raise slider number three, position number two moved, and slider number four, position number one moved. The third column is going to be pin number. I'm going to use a function in Betaflight called resource remapping to basically rearrange these motor outputs to be where they need to be. Again, I'm going to go a little quick. If you want the full tutorial, there is a video linked in the video description. and B01. See, just that simple. And now if we go to the motors tab, we can check and they should spin correctly. Motor number one, yay. Motor number two, yay. Motor number three, yay. And motor number four, yay. But we're not done yet. We also have to make sure that the motors spin the right direction. And if we look in this diagram here, we can see which direction the motors are intended to be spinning. And I'm just going to get some little spare piece of paper or anything because I don't find that touching it with my finger is always a reliable way of seeing which way it spins. I'm going to check the direction compared to the diagram. So that one's going the same direction as the diagram. Miraculously, that one is too. I'm not sure how that happened. They should all be spinning the same direction because I wired them the same, but okay. That one is too. I can't believe this is happening. Oh, thank God, one of them is going the wrong way. Okay, okay, and motor number one's going the wrong way. I just was pressing the paper on it a little weird. Motor number one and motor number four are going the wrong way. Here's how we fix that. I'm gonna disconnect from Betaflight and I'm going to start up the application BL Heli Suite 32. Again, I have a tutorial showing you how to install Betaflight and BL Heli Suite. And I'm going to assume you've already done that. If not, there's a link in the video description. I'm going to run BL Heli Suite 32, and I'm going to pick my COM port here and hit connect. You do need to have disconnected from Betaflight for this to work. Otherwise, they'll, they'll conflict. And then I'm going to hit read setup. And that's all amazing. And then I'm going to right click down here on motor number one and motor only motor number one will be selected. I'm gonna change the motor direction from normal to reversed, and I'm gonna hit right setup. And then I'm gonna do the same for motor number four. I'm gonna right click, change the direction to reversed, and right setup. And then the last thing I can do is I can hit check, and then ESC overview, and just double click, double check that motor number one and motor number four are reversed. Now, I reversed motors one and four. You might need to reverse different motors depending on how you wired it up. If you didn't wire yours exactly the same as me, you might need to reverse different ones. But for me, motors one and four are what needed to be reversed, and I've done that. I'm then gonna hit disconnect. And then once again, I'm gonna double check. Never assume that it went right. You could have made a mistake. I'm gonna just uh, spin the motors again and double check. Motor one, two, three, four, all going the right way. PID tuning tab. PID tuning is 
we don't, we can fly the default PIDs. It's going to be fine. There are a couple changes that I'm going to suggest you make. Number one, disable D min. Why? Don't worry about it. Number two, go to the filter settings and move these filter sliders over to 1.5. This is a very high end quadcopter we've just built. It can handle it and it's going to make it fly much better. Number three, here, down here, put these values in for the dynamic notch filter, change the width percent to zero, the Q to 250, the min hertz to 90, and the max hertz to 350. Why? And save that. And if you have rates that you know you like, put your rates in. The default rates are okay. Um, if you don't have preferences yet and you can set up your OSD, your on-screen display. Um, you're going to want to do that after you've got your DJI goggles set up because not all of these OSD elements, only a few of these OSD elements actually will work with the DJI goggles, but some of them do. You can tweak this and move these things around in your DJI goggles. I'm going to disconnect here. The next thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to plug in your DJI goggles to your PC, use your DJI app to you know, register the goggles and update the firmware on the goggles. There are videos out there showing how to do that, so we're not going to do that as part of this build. And then you're going to need to bind the DJI goggles to the DJI Air unit, which I will show you. It only takes a second. So we're going to open up the DJI Assistant app. Um, and when you plug in the USB to your device, it should show up there. At that point, you will need to register it if this is the very first time that you've plugged it in. Once it's registered, you'll have the option to update the firmware. You should always update the firmware on your DJI stuff as soon as you get it. And you should frequently check, like every couple months maybe check, to see if there's a firmware update because they are constantly rolling out new features and, and firmware updates often add really cool new stuff. Um, so you're going to update the firmware. That'll take a minute. And when that's done, uh, you're ready to go. All right, it's about five or six minutes later. The firmware update on the goggles is complete, and now it is time to register and update the firmware on the air unit. Now that the DJI goggles and air unit are all activated and registered and updated, we got to bind them. We got to tell these goggles that they talk to this air unit. And that's pretty simple. We're going to plug in the goggles with a battery 4S maximum, 17 volts maximum. Don't accidentally mix up my 6S and my 4S. Fry the goggles. Goggles are powered up. We're going to power up the air unit at the same time. There we go. On the underside of the goggles, there is a little button here. This is the bind button. Oh look, a paperclip. Okay, they are now bound and we should have image. Let's check. We do, hello, we do have image. I should see the battery voltage in the lower right corner of the screen, 23.6 volts. That's good, that means that's all working. I'm, yeah, we're ready to button it up. There's one more check we need to do. One is to arm and disarm the quad and make sure that it actually works. The other is we need to do a fail safe check. And the way that works is we arm. And then since we're using crossfire, the easiest way to do it is just to remove the module from the back of the radio and the motor should stop and oh, even start beeping. So if, if when you do the fail safe check, the motors don't stop, do not fly the quad. Because if you fail safe, if you lose your radio link, it will just fly away to never, never land and you'll never see it again. So fail safe check passed. Let's button it up and let's go fly. And the first thing I think we're going to do is install these arm covers here. These protect the wires and make them look neat. And they just go down over the arms and then we're going to get some black electrical tape or whatever color you prefer.
That's probably more tape than I needed, but oh well. Got the top plate here, the long standoffs. We're gonna get the long standoffs and put the front standoffs in. For the front standoffs, there is actually a nose bumper here. And I'm gonna just, I've kind of lost track of which screws go where, but I'm gonna see if I can pick a slightly longer screw. Is the standoff threaded all the way through? Now you got a really long screw. I actually like to have super long screws on the front so that you just have that little bit more stiffness up there, so. One thing that I definitely am gonna do is put some strain relief on this XT60. In a crash, the battery ejects, your battery strap breaks, it goes flying and it tugs on this, and we don't want it tugging on these electronics. Get that sorted out in a second. I just wanna get the, kinda of get it roughly in place. I'm gonna take this and just give it a little twist maybe. There you go. So that is gonna kinda of hold that in place if there's ever a battery ejection and take some of the stress. The top plate will go on. There we go. All right. Uh, last step is install the battery pad. Uh, the Apex comes with this Velcro battery pad. Some pilots who are very, very concerned about weight will put Velcro on their batteries and then use a Velcro pad. Um, I prefer to use this rubberized pad because you don't have to put any special, you can just use any battery that you want. Interesting. Get that lined up, there we go. I love that you put the uh, 30 degrees right there in the design. That's so many people overlook that. It's kind of annoying, you're just guessing. I really appreciate that. Battery strap included with the frame. Always want a rubberized, grippy battery strap. We're gonna use this one because that's what we got. Pony up the extra dollar. Good. Look at that. Beautiful. Now we just got to go and fly it. So, you know. So, I'm excited. Thank you, Joshua. Built uh -huh. my quad. You know. That's what this that's what this was. This was just a trick to get me to build a quad for him. He's like, "Oh, let's make a movie." Yeah, well, you know, if it gets on Netflix, no biggie. At least I have a quad made by Joshua Bardwell. I think it'd be all right. I think it'd be okay. Yeah. Just uh, go slow. Don't punch the throttle right off the bat. And, uh, you know, if it crashes, it crashes. That happens. It's also my first time piloting with uh, 50 megabits per second, apparently. Oh, DJI. DJI goggles. Totally. Moving up in the world. Yes. <laughs> Leaving behind that slum analog. Lemon lime props, right? Is that what it's called? That's right. Yeah. Should be able to just take off right from here, and you know we're kind of up on a hill. Beeper. Okay. Turtle mode is this right? Yeah. Or angle? Oh yeah, is this you're angle? right. So all the way, you're in acro now. Do acro? you want angle? Angle? No, acro. Yeah. Yeah, acro. Yep. But what was turtle? This one? Turtle is. This is. Angle and turtle. Okay, here we go. Maiden flight. We're gonna take it easy to see how it handles. <laughs> as far as you know, it's the maiden flight. Yeah, here we go. Everything looks green, connected, the goggles. We're looking great. Press 
fire antennas attached. <laughs> How's it fly, James? Oh, wow. A lot of power. Has so much response. so fast. Wow. Look at that latitude, the control. I can even see like my fingers shaking. Whew. The other thing is I've been flying my six inch TBS uh, source one frame. Six inches, much more heavy frame, much more heavy build. Being able to see this much definition really makes a difference. Kale okay, coming for a little land. I can't wait to fly this more and uh, you know, my skill has to be pushed to a higher level now to be able to catch up to the capability I can tell just feeling how this drone handles uh, so well. So, exciting. You wanna give it a spin, Joshua? Heck yeah. snappiness in these rates. <laughs> Try not to crash your quad on like five minutes into the first flight. It flies nice. It flies really nice. Very little prop wash oscillation. The motors didn't feel hot, so my little tuning tweaks didn't aren't causing us any trouble. How fast is it? It's okay. I think it's about time to bring it in. Well, that was a lot of fun. Joshua and I got to fly it right before sundown. It was an awesome experience to be able to watch and capture Joshua building my drone. If you did follow along and you actually built a drone today with this tutorial, I'd love to invite you to connect with me on Instagram to share some of your videos and photos. I'll also be posting on my Instagram some updates on how the FPV documentary progress is coming along as we're trying to build buzz and we're trying to bring awareness to it so that it can launch well on a platform. I'd like to thank you for watching this long video tutorial and I hope that you guys enjoy flying your quad.